Matthew 18, we're going to be looking at the first six verses there, but uh, again this morning I want to draw attention to what, you know, where, where we're going with this now months long series of, of messages, most of which has come from the gospel of Matthew, but it is teaching them to observe whatsoever things they've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the ages, that second half of the Great Commission. And it is much of what the Lord has ordained the gathering of his people together for this purpose, that, that we would reinforce in each other's lives the things that the Lord spoke to us the direction that he gave us, the commands and instructions that he gave us for life. These are the, the directions for kingdom life. When we surrender our life to Christ, I, mean, I use specific, very specific and uh, intentional language when I, when I lay these things out because I've seen so much over the course of of my own upbringing and then my then conversion and now 30 some years of walking with the Lord, I've seen very much um, dilution of what it means to be saved, of what it means to be a believer, of what it means to be someone who is a Christian. This is a uh, This is a complete change of life. It's a complete orientation, orientation change. We, we were oriented to serve, you know, we were self-centered, we were self-willed, we were self-guided, we were seeking our own ends and our own purposes, but God heads us off on that road and he turns us to himself and then we realize and I know very few people, I mean, there's been a few megalomaniacs over the, the course of history that, you know, were like Augustus Caesar and said, hey, I'm a god, by the way. I thought I'd let you in on that. Uh, many have, many have, have tried to play the part without claiming the title, but mankind is, that's the default setting is I'm God. I'll thank you anyway, but I'll guide my own life. I'll do my own thing. And that, that rebellion that's innate within the human soul, that has to be surrendered. And when it's surrendered, then we find ourselves pointed towards Christ and his rule and reign. He, he rules over all things and he rules our hearts. He rules our life and he has a very specific, well laid out rule and reign for our life. He has instructions that he gives us as to how we can know when our hearts are rightly related to him, while we're rightly oriented with him, when our, when our heart suddenly jumps up and says, this should be the reaction that you should have in this particular situation. When our hearts are rightly oriented towards God, there is another voice on the inside that says, not so quick, not so quick. You, you really shouldn't shoot that person in the face. You should have a kind response because you know, there, there's something within us that, that just desires to have our own will in our own way. And when that's thwarted, that it, it can be really ugly. All of us have a different threshold to these things. But in the particular instance that we're looking into this morning, there was a, I think it's all in all probably a, a mostly wholesome, Desire. I don't think it's a it's a, a vainglorious desire to be great. But this is what the, the disciples were asking Jesus about. 
they that they decided that they wanted to know you know, you you keep talking about the kingdom of heaven you keep talking about the kingdom of god you came preaching to, to people to repent, to surrender, because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You, you keep saying these things. So who's going to be great within this kingdom? Now, granted, their, their assumption, I'm sure, was that they would be among the greatest because, hey, we were the first 12 asked to be followers. We were the called, that, that first generation of called. So, you know, I'm sure that the 12 here will be the greatest, but while it's just us, who's the greatest among us? Who, who's going to be the top of the heap? And this is the way that, that episode goes here in Matthew 18, one through six. It says, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them and said, assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as a little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one of a little child like this in my name receives me. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Ends a little dark, but let's dig in. The, the big question, who's going to be the greatest? And, and greatness is something I think that should be. I don't think Jesus has, has the desire for greatness as in the crosshairs here. This is not the thing that he is trying to eradicate out of his disciples. Now, I mentioned a word early on in the introduction that is instrumental in finding what, what he is after. He, he is after vainglory. To, to be vainglorious is to have empty desire for preeminence among people. You know, if we're going to be a, a group of people here together, there will be as much within us as there is within a flock of chickens, a pecking order. That there is always a pecking order. And what Jesus is coming to them with is the idea that, okay, what are you asking me about? Do you want to know who has the, the first beak in the trough, or the first beak into the food, who can, who can peck the others away and have preeminence? Or do you really want to know what greatness is by kingdom definition? So this is another one of these places where we see diametrically opposed definitions, that it is a very clear dividing line between worldly greatness and kingdom greatness. Jesus, again, is not telling you if you desire to be great, then you're cast out and you're, you're, you're unworthy and and I'll have nothing to do with you. But he goes out of his way to define the greatness that should be sought, the greatness that should be aspired to. Because excellence is what we're talking about, where we're talking about excelling in that which we put our hearts and minds to. It's a commendable thing when somebody chooses a profession and then begins to excel in business, it begins to excel in a production environment, begins to excel in their managerial skills, be, being able to excel in a, a chosen craft. But whatever they put their hand to, they should always desire to excel. Why is that? 
Well, your excellence as a human being, your abilities, your excellence can redound to the glory of God. You, you were created in the image of God. So if you creatively go about your work, you are reflecting the glory of God in that. And we should try to excel in everything that we do, not for some vain glory, empty glory, empty reputation, entry, empty proclaiming of our goodness and preeminence among others, but for the purpose of bringing glory to God. This, this idea of greatness is what Jesus is drawing a very fine point to. He goes out of his way here, and in this, in Matthew's gospel, he shares more detail than what, like Luke's gospel, just has a single verse that tells this story, but we get more detail here. So we're going to try to dig into that. They ask the question. Have you ever asked a question and then you begin, you know, about halfway through the answer, you think, man, why did I ever ask that? Well, and then usually if you ask me, <laughs> then that's about the point in the conversation. Well, if you didn't want to know, you shouldn't ask. Well, th this is where the disciples find themselves, that they're in that place where they're being as you know, the Old Testament, or they're being weighed in the balance. Now, are they found wanting? Time will tell. But they're being weighed in the balance. Jesus is not giving them an indictment straight towards them, but he's giving them the definitions whereby they might rightly assess their own condition. Am I great or am I not? But where do I fall on this scale? Do I want to be great in the eyes of the Lord? Do I want to have his acclaim? Because there's coming a time when every single one of us will stand before him and give an account of those things which are done in the flesh. And at the end of that, there will be many that he will say, enter in my good and faithful servant. You'll be acknowledged for your faithfulness to the degree to the, to the degree that it costs you costly obedience to, to be faithful to him. The more that it costs, the more that it will be praised on that day, the more that it'll be worth on that day. Now, do we do it for that purpose? I'm telling you this morning, there is absolutely nothing wrong with pursuing the, the, the greatest amount of that on that day. Because everything that you have accomplished during the course of your life that had its source in Christ, it was his idea, it was his power, it was for his glory, it brought a claim to him. One day, he's going to acknowledge that and it will be rewarded to you. You will be given that which he determines is a right reward for such things. I'm not going to go through the whole, I've done this so many times, I'm definitely not going to do it again this morning. But, but it's, this, it's this idea that you know, the, the course of our life is accumulated in those things which pass through that fiery judgment and it came out of the fire and it was, its source was in the Lord and it's already been tried by fire and, and it's in our possession and a crown has been made of that. And then that crown is brought before our Lord on that day and as an act of worship, we lay at his feet all the things that he enabled us to do through the course of our life. Our reward is having that which we can present to him that he did in us, that he did through us, that, that we accomplished in him. And those things, that faithfulness that he enables is that which we will desperately desire to have we, we are rewarded for faithfulness. 
we're rewarded for that which we were called to. So it, it, it it's faithfulness. It's not the, the perceived fruitfulness of it. If you were called to uh, be a world evangelist and have a massive ministry that that circumnavigates the globe and hundreds and of thousands of people in each nation that you visit, you know, come under the preaching of the word and, and the word is fruitful and people are born into the kingdom. And if you're faithful in that, you get a faithful person's reward. If you're, if you're faith, if you were called specifically to raise godly children and you faithfully live out that calling of sowing your whole life into the spiritual formation of your children and your children are raised up and there they are firmly founded in the kingdom and, and your life's work is accomplished. Sure, you did other things beyond that, but your primary function was to raise up that generation, that generation that would follow you of just absolute firm Christian men and women. And at the end, you think, well, all I did was raise some kids. All I did was, the vast majority of what I did was just within my family. And this person over here, they did this huge work around the globe. Each one will be rewarded according to their calling, faithfulness to that which the Lord commanded of them. So there is no, it, it could be that, that the person with the, the highest perceived impact in the world, that person may have not accomplished, may have not have obeyed, may have not have done nearly as much in the way of faithfulness as that person who labored in obscurity in the home to raise up a generation of world changers. Because this is the seed sown. This is the, this is the yeast in the loaf. This is the seed sown that keeps replicating itself. That, but we are, we are called to faithfulness. I'm not going to go farther down that path because I did not intend to go down that path to begin with. Back to the text. So greatness in the kingdom of heaven, Jesus calls a little child to him and sets him in the midst. So, something that came out of this this time through that, that I just had not seen previously. This is part of the point. This isn't like Jesus says, I take a child, now I'm going to use this child as the illustration for my point here. He calls a child to him. And what does the child do? Well, it says that he set him in the midst. So the child came to Jesus. The child had a can't come to Jesus moment. The child just heard the call and comes to the call and finds himself in the hands of Jesus, and then Jesus places him where he wants him. Jesus takes the child and puts him in the midst and puts him on display for others to see Jesus' point that he was making to his disciples. Because look, th this was th the setting here is Jesus and his disciples. This wasn't played out in front of a throng of, of a multitude. This was play, played out in the, may not just been the 12, couldn't have been because there was a small child there. So, But somebody's child was there. there so there were some others looking on, but it's a small intimate setting. And Jesus says, 
Come here. Come here. Now, children are amazing. Children are unique. But children do have overall, I mean, I know some children will not have some of these characteristics, but some of the things that I'm going to speak of of children are close to universal. He says, children are like this. Children come and children come to the loving voice of Jesus. Jesus was approachable. Good grief, Jesus was a, a friend of sinners. So, I mean, even, you know, religious folk were not comfortable around Jesus. You know, the, the scribes and Pharisees that we've talked about the last few weeks, uh, those, those scribes and Pharisees, they were always bristly. They were, have you ever tried to hug a stiff child? You know what I mean? You know, that, that child that just, oh, now I don't want any part of this. Um, you know, of our grandchildren, we have some that are just snuggly. You know, maybe 90% of the time, you just feel like you need a spatula to pull them off the ceiling or whatever. But then whenever it gets quiet in the evening, then it's snuggle time and they just snuggle all into you. It just warms your heart. Well, this is the way, these are the things that I believe Jesus was talking about whenever he said, unless you become as a little child, unless you turn, unless you are converted, and that word converted there in verse three, that word converted there 90% of the time plus, that word is translated turned. But it also, in, it's used in the context of conversion at other times. So Jesus turned to them and healed them. Jesus also turned the water into wine. Same, same word. Same word here. So it, the idea there is unless you turn so as to change, unless you are converted, unless you are transformed, unless you become as a little child, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven points there. The points being this, that unless you become as little children, every single one of us, nobody starts out as a mature believer. You may start out as a knowledgeable believer. I would have been among those because of my upbringing in a, in a solid Christian home and a solid believing church that taught the Bible very, uh, very purposefully in a focused way. I, I said under 18 years of Bible proclamations, I had a lot of knowledge. But when I was 26, I was converted. I turned and I became as a little child. I, I became that kind of dependent upon God. And all of us start as immature believers some of us start as immature believers with almost no knowledge of the kingdom. Others of us start as immature believers with a vast knowledge of the kingdom and its truth and its principles and the things that are laid out within it. But everybody starts in an immature place in living it out. So this is part of Jesus's point here, unless you be you are converted and become as little children, you can't even enter into the kingdom. You have to have that humbling moment where you realize Jesus is calling me, even me. He's calling me out of darkness. He's calling me into his glorious light. He's calling me into his presence to do life with him. 
This is what's going on. I'm not just looking for fire insurance. I'm not looking just to escape the judgment to come. I'm looking for a life with God. Jesus calls to them and they turn to him. They turn to him as savior because he's the only one that can keep them away from judgment. They turn to him as Lord because he's the only one that has the knowledge to guide their life. He's the only one that loves them enough to provide them the leadership that they need to navigate through this life in a way that will maximize their life in the hereafter. We, we were born for eternity. And this small, that, that little hyphen between the date you were born and the date that you die on your tombstone, that little hyphen means a lot for all eternity because we were born for more than this. This life determines destiny. And what Jesus is calling us to is to himself. He calls us to himself in those two main dimensions, Savior and Lord. And when we as little children just in utter dependence. And that's the first thing that I want to bring about is the knowledge of a child's dependence. Children, small children, are utterly dependent upon their parents. They are dependent upon their parents for all that they don't know, all that they need, for, for their sustenance, for their correction, for their direction. They are dependent completely on their parents. This is the, the orientation that God brings every single one of us into. He brings us into an orientation to himself to where we acknowledge our utter dependence upon him. No good thing that is in my flesh. I bring nothing into this relationship except for my dependence upon him. And then he is glorified in any good thing that comes out of me because I had nothing to produce that. I'm, no amount of study can produce that. No amount of, of bootstrap effort can pull me up and put me in a place where, where, where I can glorify God. It is God and God alone. Utter dependence upon him. Now, this weekend... Got to spend a little bit more time than usual with, with grandkids and one in particular, little Sawyer. Sawyer's three, and he has a word. He has a word that he will wear out and wear you out with. Why? <laughs> Why? Children are curious. Children want to know how the world works. Children, children are, are, are voracious learners. That they, they want to know everything. And they have a capacity to only know a little bit at a time. And there's things that they can't know that they want to know until they know other things that they don't care to know. We are children in that sense. We, we want to know. You, we, we want to know the timeline. I mean, that's why you, you could, you know, retire if you have, if you can promote one good prophecy chart, especially when Israel's at war, you promote one good prophecy chart and you can retire because everybody wants to know, you know, what, where, what's going on in the newspaper today? Where does that fit into the book of Revelation, Ezekiel, Daniel, and three of the Psalms? You know, where, where does that fit in? And we want to know all of these things, but there, and I'm not saying we can't know some of those things, but there's so many other things that you must know. And when we are dependent upon God for our knowledge, for the nurture and admonition, you know, we're commanded as parents to raise our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. How much more is the Lord himself going to raise us up in the way that we should go and then when we are old, we'll not depart, not depart from it. See, there's the, all of that. There's the why. So some people would discourage you from wearing the Lord out with whys. I think the, the why question 
is purely a sign of Sawyer's genius, or at least his high intelligence, <laughs> because that's how you learn, is why. Why? Why? Why, why, were you, why? why were you tired? Why were you the last one to the truck when we went squirrel hunting? Well, because I'm fat and old. Why? <laughs> because I haven't died or dieted. Those were my exact answers, by the way, because he'd worn me out. <laughs> See, we, we, are, we, we are inquisitive creatures by creation. We were, we were created for fascinated lives. Can you imagine living a life where you never ask why? You know what kind of a life that would be? That would be a life where there was no perceived purpose. If you don't believe there's a God, if you don't believe he's good, bad, or indifferent, if, you, if you're just living as if this is all there is and, and there's no moral consequence to anything in this world and you're just living like that, then you never have to answer or ask the question why because there would never be a good answer. Now, nearly everyone does. Even the people who have no belief in God ask why, but there's no... There's no other answer than him. He's the ultimate why in everything. He is the ultimate why. And when we are curiously childlike in our faith, then we, we come at him with why. This just happened. Well, why? Now, typically when we ask why, it's because something painful happened. But we should be asking every, every much as often when a good thing happens. Well, why did that happen? I don't deserve anything good from your hand. What were you doing in allowing some good to come into my life? What were you doing in allowing some pain to come into my life? Why? 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 And knowing, expecting a good answer. This is childlike faith asks a genuine why because it perceives there must be a purpose. If there is a God and if he is good and he is, there must be a purpose in my pain. There must be a purpose in my blessing. There must be a purpose in you fill in the blank. Whatever is a mystery to you has an answer in God. I want to stir up the why in your spirit. I want you to engage God constantly with whys. It will invigorate and ignite your prayer life like very few other things to take everything you question and bring it before God. Well, I can't question God. Read the Psalms. Just read the Psalms. How many of those start out with David or some other psalmist just down in what a former pastor from here, Dennis Porter, would call the mully grubs. I'm not sure what that is, but it was a it was a very low state. So you're in the mully, and you you find yourself. Why? Why did this happen? And, and you know how people are. People will say things like, "Well, how could a God, good God let this happen?" That, that's a valid question, but the attitude, the, the tone of that question is going to reveal as much about you as it ever will about God. Think about it in these terms. Just listen to the difference in the asking of that question. Well, how could a good God ever let something like that happen? Or how is it that a good God allows something like that to happen. The, the second perceives there must be a purpose. It assumes the goodness of God. You know why I can assume the goodness of God? He did not withhold his own son. How will he not with him freely give me all things? That, that's Romans, if you're checking. You, you can find it there. He gave us his own son. He did not withhold himself. 
the third person of the Trinity. He did not withhold himself, but went to a cross to die an ignominious death and find himself in, in, in complete and utter shame and disgrace, put to death unjustly, the just for the unjust. He does all of that. He does not withhold himself from that, but he gives himself for us. And then we're going to question whether he might have some good purpose for the painful stretch that we've just gone through. I guarantee you he does. Because he is in control and he is good. Therefore, our why should be focused in this direction. How is it that this is good? How is it that you are good in the midst of what I'm going through? They're teachable. Now, the episode I was talking about, you know, after we got back from, from squirrel hunting Thursday morning, the why and the why and the why. Well, he's just taking all of this in. You know, okay, okay. You're, you're old because you didn't die young. I get that. And he goes on to the next thing. You know, we, we, we look at these things and we see that children are teachable. Children are teachable. They're teachable when they're told you're stupid and you'll never amount to anything. My God doesn't have to behave that way towards his children. And of course we shouldn't ours. But what is spoken to a child matters. We, we're going to have our hearts trained up by somebody. God help us if it's not the Lord. So teachable. And this is slightly different, but uh, it's very similar. One is a means to the other, and it is moldable. They can be, they can be shaped. They can be shaped and then fired and fixed in that position. This is the, this is the idea of he is the potter, and I am the clay. I'm the child of God that he is fashioning in his own image. Romans again. We're going to talk about Romans quite a bit this morning. Romans again says that we are predestined. As believers, we are predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So his son is the mold. And we are placed in the mold and pressure is applied and then we're shaped to be like him. You have a destiny, and your destiny is to be just like Jesus. Just like Jesus would be if he were you. So you'll look a little different, but you are headed to a place where your character is like his, your, your, your desires will be like his, your actions will be like his, that you will mirror him, you will be able therefore to rule and reign with him, that this is what we're being crafted for, we're being fashioned, we're being taught, but it's far more than, it is far more than teaching. This is one of the things that I'm learning. Because you know how I, how I am, or most of you do anyway. I'm a, I'm a voracious consumer of information. I, I just, volumes and volumes of, of, of books. And, and if I am not incredibly careful, I will find myself loading my brain full of knowledge that I've not assimilated into. It's not making a difference in my Mondays and my Tuesdays. It's not, it's not working its way into, it's not forming me. So being taught by itself does not automatically change who we are. It changes what we know. 
Now, what we know gives us that which has the ability to change who we are. But this is ultimately what God is after. He is after changing you and changing me into the image of his son. So as children are moldable, the, they, the, the pressures of life and the information that's given to them are the raw materials by where they are molded, crafted, shaped. Um, gave Terry a book this morning. I've been telling him for a while I was going to pass along to him. It was written by a guy named Jack Hayford. And Jack Hayford, for years, I mean, I, I ordered my Sunday afternoons. That was back before DVR and all that good stuff. I would order my afternoons around Jack Hayford's radio or his television program. It was on at 2 o'clock Sunday afternoon. And we could do things either side of that, but Jack Hayford and his... His program was called Spirit Formed. It is the Bible that he wrote a commentary, he had a New Testament, and, and it was the Spirit Formed Bible. It, it was, it's this idea of being shaped, being changed, taking the essential who you are and pressing it into a shape, into a, a functional uh, a functional form that serves the purposes of God. That this is what God has for each and every one of us. And as if we come to him as little children, we come to him with the capacity to change. How many of you, and I want to see a show of hands here, how many of you like change? Honest people, thank you for a zero show of hands. And I didn't even, I didn't even show you how to raise your hand by raising my own because I don't like change. The weird thing is, is God has called me into this life and into his kingdom to be an agent of change in your life and in my own. Uh, but do I like change? Nobody likes change. <laughs> Children are moldable. To come with the faith of a little child looks to that one who is providing that influence that's going to form them. It, 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 it's another portion of this dependence. It's this, okay, you're the potter, I'm the clay. I'm not going to tell you, you know, I, I can tell you how I feel about what you're doing right now, but I'm trusting you. I'm staying right there in your hands. It's a little dizzy. I, I think the wheel's spinning entirely too fast and I feel like I'm going to be flung apart, but I trust that your hands are going to keep all of this together and you're going to shape me into that. And I know when you're done shaping that you're going to put me in a fire and that's going, to, that's going to glaze me. That's going to make me both fixed the way that I am and, and it's going to beautify my life. I know all of that and I know it's fire and it's good because it's you, but children are moldable. One other thing that I've noticed about children, and you can see it in the ones that have it and the ones that don't, but children long to belong. They long to belong. That they, they desire to be a part of a loving family. They were created for such a place. God, God created mankind in the garden. And he created that to be the capacity to have a family living in complete unity. That's, that was the purpose in the beginning. And we, we were created to belong. We, we have that longing. It's one of the deepest longings of the human heart is to belong. So much so that if people are starved of it, they will find it somewhere. They'll find it even in like a, a violent gang, they will find it in uh, lots of wrong places. They'll, they'll find it 
in a in a party scene. You remember back when I was a young man, there the the show usually began with an uh, overweight, middle-aged guy going into an establishment, and everybody in the place would say, Norm! It was a place where he belonged. It was the old, the old sitcom Cheers. A place where they belonged. They had community. They, there was a place where they belonged. There, there is a children long to belong. There, there is a longing in the human heart to belong. And when we are when we are offered that place in the in the in the family of God, that, that seat at his table, that place in his family. Think, like, well, yeah, but he just treats us nice. But, you know, this whole idea of God being father, and he's father. And you have an inheritance. You have a place at his table. He has adopted you. you the, the spirit of adoption has gone out to you, and his spirit is within you crying out, Abba, Daddy, Father, you belong. You belong to this family. You belong to the family of God, the household of God, and you belong to the, the same family that the people over here at the Methodist, the people at, at Woodlawn, the people that worship all over Salem and everywhere in between around the world. You belong to a family, a family that has been established for the purpose of your belonging to it. We, we have overemphasized that those of us in, in Protestant streams of the body of Christ have overemphasized personal salvation. I absolutely believe in it 100%. You must have your own conversion. You must have your own relationship with God, but you will never have your own apart from the body. You, you were saved into a body. You were you were created with a place of belonging right there, created for you. As usual, got a lot left here, and I'm not going to run us any longer than we already have. But I, I do want to just kind of encapsulate a little bit of what the re why I read the rest of this. It says, therefore, whoever humbles himself as a little child is greatest in the kingdom of God. These are the things and any others that are applicable out of the word of God to these things. These are the things that you need to excel in. Excel in your dependence upon God. Excel in, in your longing to belong in, in his context, in his kingdom, in his family, in his body as his bride and hit that relationship that you have with Christ himself. I may just save the rest of this to kick off next week, but um, I've said enough. I long for your greatness. I long to be great myself, but, but I long for your greatness. I want you to be an example to the rest of the body of Christ and for all those outside the body of Christ looking at, at the body, looking at us saying, what, what gets them motivated to live their life in this way? And it's their, their fascination with God. It is their pursuit of him. It is their longing to belong all of those things. I'll close with this. First Peter 5, verses 5 through 7 says, Likewise, you younger people, submit to your yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive one to another 
and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all of your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for the way that it establishes us in your truth, Lord. We thank you for the principles of the kingdom that is communicated to us through it. And Holy Spirit, we ask you that you will seal these things in our heart, that it might be not just things that we know now that we might not have known before we came in, but Lord, that, that it'll change who we are, that it'll be, that it will form us, Lord. Form us through your truth, Lord. Change us into your own image from glory into glory, Lord, as we behold you as in a mirror darkly, God. We ask you, Lord, to make these things real in our life day by day. And Lord, we pray for eyes to see these things expanding in one another's life, Lord, that we might live to the praise of the glory of your grace. And we thank you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes. No.